All right, if you have your Bibles or your Bible app, we are going to be in Philippians 4. Philippians chapter 4. If you can turn there with me. Philippians chapter 4 is where we're going to be. Yeah, I can definitely tell outside the, the app seems to be the easier way to go, huh? Philippians chapter 4. Well, whether or not you are a basketball fan, one of the things that's going on this week is the NBA Finals. The NBA Finals started on Wednesday night. And so obviously we're going to have a new NBA champion very soon. And for any NBA player, that's what they dream of. That's what they're hoping to get to. And the reality is, very few actually get there. Now, there have been many who have. Guys like Bill Russell, who actually won 11 NBA championships. What is probably more familiar to a lot of us, are guys like Michael Jordan, who won six. Kobe Bryant, who won five. But see, there's the other side of the story, too, because you've got a guy like Vince Carter played 22 years in the NBA and never won a championship. So one of the things that when you look at that and go, why is it that some get there and some don't? Well, see, one of the things I think that's part of it is the preparation. Is what do these guys put into practice? What do they do, especially in the offseason when they're not involved in the regular playing? And I read a story recently that I was very kind of blown away by, but LeBron James, who is currently in the finals, hopefully trying to get his fourth NBA title, he spends over $1.5 million a year to get himself ready for basketball. $1.5 million. He spends this money on home gyms, chefs, personal trainers, okay, physical therapy, and a lot more, $1.5 million. He is invested. And it makes sense why he's playing at such a high level because he's 35, which I know to none of us is old, but in basketball years, that's old. Okay. And yet he continues to go because he has continued to invest in himself and to invest in his craft. But see, one of the things that I believe really sets him apart is he doesn't just think about the good things to do and think about ways that he can get better, he actually does them. He actually puts them into practice. And see, if you want to grow and develop at anything, you've got to spend the time. And see, the same thing is true for those who follow Jesus. If you want to follow Jesus and you want to get to know him better, what it means is you've got to put into practice what the Bible says. You've got to do it. You can't just spend time thinking about it. There has to come a point where action takes place. And so as we move forward in Philippians, Paul is telling us, okay, we've been talking about how you think, but now it's time to get to what you do. And there's some things you need to put into community practice. And so if you have your Bible or your Bible app, if you are willing and able to stand with me, let's read Philippians 4. And we're going to begin in verse 4. Philippians 4, beginning in verse 4. Always be full of the joy in the Lord. I say it again. Rejoice. Let everyone see that you are considerate in all you do. Remember the Lord is coming soon. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Keep putting into practice all you learned and received from me. Everything you heard from me and saw me doing. Then the God of peace 
will be with you. May God bless the reading of his word. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for giving us your word. And Lord, I thank you for the joy of not only reading it, studying it, spending time in it, but at living it. Because Lord, as you said in John 16, as you were talking, you said, I'm the resurrection and the life. And so, Lord, when we follow you and we follow your word, we follow your ways, it brings life. It brings joy. It brings peace. And, oh, that we would have more of it. Because, Jesus, that is what you want for us. And you were willing to die that we would experience it. So be with us this morning, please, Father. Holy Spirit, please speak. May you take your word and send it forth. And touch our hearts, touch our minds. Give us eyes to see, ears to hear. Bless this time as only you can. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. We are definitely getting near to the end of the book of Philippians. Chapter 23 is going to be it. Just a couple more messages and we will have finished the whole book. But the backdrop of this whole book in Philippians that Paul has been working through is community. Community. And I think even though we started this prior to the pandemic, it's even more so that we understand and think through this idea because we need community. We need each other. But part of what brings this community together that Paul's talking about as he's writing to the Philippians is the gospel. This common unity of this community is the gospel of Jesus Christ. The good news that Jesus came to this earth and died to pay for our sins. But not only did he pay for our sins, he rose from the grave, overcame sin. And see what it means for us as a response. It means putting our faith and trust that Jesus did what he said he was going to do. And when we put our faith in him, what we're also saying is, Jesus, now I'm following you. I'm following you. And so you get a group of people together who are saying, I'm following you. We're following Jesus together. And this becomes a force to show the world Jesus. Now, unfortunately, that's not always what it turns out to be. We still struggle. We still wrestle in the ways that we get along and how we work together. But it still should be making progress. It still should be moving forward. And so the idea is in having a relationship with Jesus, as each of, of those who call Jesus Lord and Savior. You have a personal relationship with him. And what that means is in any relationship, it should be growing. It should be developing. You should be getting to know one another even better. And that's part of Paul's point in writing to this community and also the message to us is there ought to be some maturing going on. You ought to be growing up in the faith. And see, that's the hard part about following Jesus is maturity is not Define like it is physically. Because you can have gray hair physically, but be immature spiritually. And so that's the hard thing in that as we walk through. Because we can make some assumptions about where we are. But Paul is challenging us to mature. And he says, one of the things you're going to experience as you mature in verse 4 is joy. Because you understand a little more about life and what's going on. You understand that this world is fleeting. You understand that, you know what, I don't get hung up and caught up in all the things going on politically, economically, racially, whatever it may be. I don't get caught up in that because I understand God is big. I understand God's got a plan. And it doesn't mean God won't move through that. He will, and we need to be a part of those areas. But we understand that's not where our hope lies, and that's not where we find joy. And so Paul is saying, again, I say rejoice, rejoice in the Lord. Because the fact is, if you're too busy rejoicing, you don't have time to be anxious. You're too busy rejoicing, you don't have time to be anxious. But I think we kind of get that backwards. We spend more time being anxious. And so all of that, as Paul's been walking through these last few verses, is he's trying to set up for you, this is what your mind needs to look like. Because he already said in chapter 2, have the mind of Christ. And so what does that look like? In verses 6 and 7, you need to have prayer. This is what right praying looks like, where he says, don't be anxious, don't be worried, but instead pray. 
Verse 7, then he talks about, excuse me, verse 8, right thinking. So 6 and 7 are about the praying, then verse 8 is right thinking. What's going on in your mind? Because that anxiety and worry is fueled by what you think. Oh my gosh, how are things going to work out? What's going to happen? This and that. See, and there's a lot of things in this life we just don't know. But see, now we get to verse 9 where Paul wants to address, okay, a, a lot of these things are going on inside of you, but what comes out of you? And so the right praying leads to right thinking, which leads to right living. It's got to get out. It's got to come out of you. We're talking about what you put into practice. I'm sure you've heard the phrase, practice what you preach. That can be a challenge for us, but this is what Paul is getting to. Because you can't separate the outward action from the inward thinking, the inward attitude. You can't separate those two. They go together. And this is where Paul brings us in verse 9. And so at the beginning of verse 9, Paul's pretty plain. He just says, keep putting into practice. Keep putting into practice. Paul's saying it's time to go to work. It's time to get busy. Paul's like the Nike of his day. Just do it. And I know sometimes that doesn't always feel good when someone just tells you to do something. There's that, I think that human in us, we go, I don't want to do it now because you told me to. Let's not be stubborn because Paul is saying, let's go to work. It's time to not just think about things. We've been talking about that. Now you need to do them. You actually need to live them out. But there's a word in here that I think is very important that really helps us understand how we keep putting things into practice. And that word is discipline. That word is discipline. And we're not talking about discipline, you're getting in trouble, someone's disciplining you. Discipline, I'm defining this way, to train oneself to do something in a habitual way. To train oneself to do something in a habitual way. And really, if you want to say, we're talking about self-discipline. You want to put things into practice. There has to be some discipline going on. There's that word in there, train, training. So part of that training is I'm praying, I'm thinking, and I'm doing. You've got to discipline yourself to make these things a habit. But realize in what Paul said, that word pudding, not pudding, not D, T, okay? But it's got an I-N-G on the end. I-N-G means ongoing action. It's not a one-time thing where you're like, oh, did it? I'm gone. I got it. It's all solved. Don't we wish? No, this is ongoing action. Paul understands you got to repeat this and you got to repeat this. And I'm sure many of you have heard about habits and different things. What, 21 days you got to do something in order to make it a habit? Okay. That's what Paul's talking about. You got to put this into practice, but there's got to be training. And to follow Jesus, we describe these as spiritual disciplines. Or spiritual habits. And there's a, a study in Christianity called spiritual formation. And that's what this is all about, how you're being formed. You're being formed by the disciplines, by the habits. Or these disciplines and habits are forming you. That's something we've got to consider. Which way is it going? And when I talk about spiritual disciplines and habits, Paul's already said praying. Do you have that habit? Do you have that discipline of praying? Reading your Bible, studying your Bible, digging in further. Do you have a discipline there? Do you have a habit of that? And see, as I look back on my own life, I honestly don't think those habits really got solidified in my life until about eight to 10 years ago, where it really became solid. It really became consistent. But see, part of making a habit is you've got to unlearn and get rid of some other habits. And I've talked before, I like movies, I like watching TV. That's one of the things I had to change. I had to turn the TV off and I had to go to bed because then I could get more sleep and then I could get up early. And see, now I can be up between 5 and 5.30 every day and I don't need an alarm to do it. My body just does it. And I love it. Some days I don't like it, let's be honest. I'd rather sleep a little longer. But see, that's the discipline and that's time. That's taking years to get to. And it's not all the way down, but you know what? There's a joy every morning to know, Jesus, I'm coming. Okay? Jesus, I want to be with you. And see, we want to keep putting things into practice. There's got to be some discipline in our life. And we've got to begin to look at, okay, what's keeping me from that? What's keeping me from getting there? 
And that's part of where the community comes together. Because you walk alongside people, maybe someone who has that discipline in your life, and ask them, how did you get there? What do you do? When do you read the Bible? When do you pray? What does that look like? See, the cool thing is there's not a formula. I like to walk and pray. I think for other people, it's you got to be real still. I don't think it matters which way. What I think matters is pray. And see, I think a lot of times we put rules on ourselves and we say, oh, well, it's not good enough or I don't, I don't have a lot of time. You got five minutes, take it. See, the beautiful thing is you start with five minutes and before long you know it, you're going to get to 15 and you're going to want more time. But we put these rules and these guidelines on ourselves that, oh, I'm not good enough. I didn't do that. Uh. Okay, Paul's just saying, keep putting it into practice. Keep moving, keep striving. And that maturity is going to develop in you. And that's an awesome thing. But as he's talking about putting these disciplines, these practices into place, then he helps us understand what it should be. What are some of the things beyond what I just mentioned? As he goes on in verse 9, he says, after keep putting it into practice, he says, all you learned and received from me. All you learned and received. See, Paul's taught them. Paul has been a teacher. He's taught them the gospel. He's taught them many things. And see, one of the things that's a, a beautiful thing about being a follower of Jesus is you are a disciple. That means you are a student of, you follow that person, but you are also a disciple maker. The whole intent is God has shown his grace and his mercy and his love to you so that you can show that to others. It was never intended to stop with you. It is always intended to go forward. And so Paul's saying, I've learned these things. I'm passing them on to you. But see, he uses two words in there and he puts them together, learned and received. Because what Paul's trying to say is there's a difference between learning a truth and making it a part of who you are. There's a difference between those two things and you need both. And it's the same thing he said to the Philippians in chapter 2, excuse me, the Thessalonians in chapter 2. He said, therefore, we never stop thanking God that when you received his message from us, you didn't think of our words as mere human ideas. You accepted what we said as the very word of God, which of course it is. And this word continues to work in you who believe. See, Paul's rejoicing because the Thessalonians didn't just hear it. They didn't just take these ideas and accept them, learn them. They received them. They internalized them. It became a part of not only who they are, but a part of what they do. And you see, there's a danger in our learning. And believe me, I love learning. I'm a big believer in education. But see, we can go to Bible studies. We can do workshops. We can do conferences. We can do all these things. But the danger is if you have all knowledge and no application. That's dangerous. Because where we end up is puffed up. You get a big head. I know a lot of stuff. What are you doing with what you know? And we've done classes here where we talk about how to tell others about Jesus. But in those, what did we do after is then we went out into our community. We've got to put the two together. And this is what Paul's saying. You've learned things, but receive it. Put it into practice. Make it a part of who you are. But see, this is where I think the excuses start to come in. And this is where, you know, if you remember the old cartoons where you had like the angel on one side and the devil on the other, you can kind of have that picture. And there, there's good old Satan sitting right there. Oh, you learned some good stuff, but you know what? You just, you just don't know enough yet. You just don't know enough yet. So why don't you wait till you learn a little more and then go do that. And see, then we start to buy that. Oh, yeah, you're right. Oh, and I don't know uh, uh, as much as so-and-so. Oh, man, they know, the, they know the Bible so well. I don't know as much as they do. And see, what we start to do is we just put ourselves on the sideline. We put ourselves on the sideline. And I've heard different things. You know, I'm not a teacher or I'm not this or I'm not good at speaking or whatever it may be. No. See, if you've learned something, if you've learned anything, share that with somebody. I mean, if you spend time and you're reading in Romans 8 and it's talking about the love of God and nothing 
can separate you from his love. And that just overwhelms you and you are thinking about it and excited about that. Tell somebody about that. That's passing on what God is doing. You never know how that could be a blessing to somebody else who is struggling at that moment, not sure if God loves them. But see, we make it like it's got to be certain things. Well, it's a class or this or that. No, just share it. Take the knowledge that God has given you and pass it along. Because otherwise, it's just facts in your head. It's going to be facts in your head. The facts in your head are not enough. The facts in your head have got to become truths in your heart. And see, I love what the psalmist said in Psalms 119, 11. He says, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. And this is exactly what Paul's talking about. The psalmist is saying, God, your word has become so rich, so powerful to me. It's not just gotten into my mind. It's gotten into my heart, and it's coming out because I'm living this life in a way that I don't want to offend you. I don't want to sin against you. And so I'm taking all that I've learned and received, and I'm putting it into practice. But also, I think what makes this hard for us is Paul is using them as himself as an example. And I think a lot of us look at ourselves and go, I hope nobody's watching me. Well, they are. And Paul continues on in verse 9. The next part he says, everything you have heard from me and saw me doing. So you learned and received these things from me and you heard from me and saw me doing things as well. So now that you've been listening, you've been watching and seeing all that I'm doing. Because Paul didn't just teach the word, he lived it. He lived it. But the hardest thing I think for us as we approach the Bible is we look at people and we just kind of elevate. Oh man, I could never be like Paul. Oh, David, he had a heart. It says a, a man after God's own heart. Yeah, that man after God's own heart had somebody murdered committed adultery. Paul was standing there while Stephen is getting stoned. He's trying to do everything he can to stop what was called the way, which is those who followed Jesus at that time. See, if anything, the Bible ought to give us a picture of this is what God can do with anybody. If God can do that with them, what can he do with me? And not anything that we ought to get puffed up about, but something we ought to have hope in. All right could do this and see what Paul's really getting at in that the fact that he's living this out is that more is caught than taught people may not necessarily remember what you say but they'll remember what you do and it's not to say that your words aren't important they are but if your actions don't back up your words then your words become meaningless and that's why James Chapter 1, verse 22 reminds us, don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you're only fooling yourselves. You're only fooling yourself. I don't know about you all. I don't want to be a fool. I do not want to be a fool. And so we have an opportunity. Paul had an opportunity, but we do as well to be an example in what we say, but also in what we do. But again, I think this is where those, those excuses, those hard places can kind of creep in. I'm not an example to anybody. Who, I mean, who's watching me? You would be surprised. I mean, unless you are a hermit, you're going to be around somebody somewhere. And see, being around other people means influence. And if you think about your life right now, for some of you, it's your grandkids. You have influence on them, and you're hoping to have more influence on them. It's your own kids. For some of you who aren't parents yet, it it may be your siblings that you have an influence on. But see, a lot of times I don't think we see ourselves that way. If you're a student, it may be other students, maybe your friends, the coworkers. Anytime you interact with other people, Is our life given an opportunity for the Holy Spirit to point to something, to point to a difference, for somebody to look at you and go, 
Why are you handling this situation differently? Why are you living like this? This doesn't make sense to me. Our world's freaking out. Everybody's losing their mind, and you're calm. Why is that? See, you have an opportunity to have influence. And so as Paul is saying, everything you heard from me and saw me doing, we have that same opportunity. But you've got to keep practicing what you're doing. And please understand, it's not perfect. See, the only thing that is perfect is how God sees you. And the reason it's perfect, because God sees you through Jesus. And Jesus is perfect. If you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you have been made perfect in the eyes of God. And yet you are still being perfected. That means you are still being made like Jesus. And that's hard sometimes to realize. How can God look at me like that? I don't look at myself that way, which I think is a lot of us what we think. But God can use you. And see, when we define ourselves the way God defines us, man, that's better than anything the world's going to do. But at the end of verse 9, then Paul reminds us, what do you get from all this? Where do you end up? And he says, then the peace, excuse me, the God of peace will be with you. The God of peace will be with you. He's been talking about peace and already mentioned that in verse, verses 6 and 7. What's going to guard you? What's going to guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus? Peace. As Paul's sitting there chained in prison and he sees that guard right next to him, that's his picture. And for you and I, that's peace right there guarding us. Because I'm busy rejoicing. Peace is guarding me. I don't have to be anxious about anything. And as I walk forward, I don't walk forward in perfection, knowing God sees me as new, but I walk in humility. I walk in honesty. Because see, when I blow it, when I mess up, when I sin... It doesn't change God's love for me. I can confess that sin. I can make it right. I can get right with other people that I offend and hurt. And I keep going. And see, I think a lot of what the world needs to see is more honest Christians. Yes, we struggle. Yes, it's hard. Yes, it's challenging. But you know what? Jesus is everything I need. And I'm going to keep looking at him. I'm going to keep turning to him. And Paul reminds us then, what do you get? The God of peace will be with you. We never walk alone. We never walk alone. And I think especially right now, there are days where we feel like it. But see, as we have right praying, which leads to right thinking and right living. And that is the environment where peace grows. That's the environment where we get to experience peace. But see, it comes down to, are we going to do what the Bible says? Are we going to take the Bible seriously? Are we going to pick and choose? Eh, I don't really like that verse. That's kind of hard. Loving my enemy? Nah. I'd rather hold a grudge. See, are we going to pick and choose? Praying for my enemies? Oh, man. Asking someone forgiveness that you've hurt. Ah, man. Are we going to take it seriously? Are we going to do what the Bible says? Are we going to do these practices that Paul has been talking about? Are we going to follow this book? Will we invest in this? You see, today's game three of the NBA Finals. Obviously, I don't know who's going to win. But that investment that LeBron James has made in himself, he's hoping it's going to be him. And see, the fact is, you and I don't have to invest millions of dollars to follow Jesus. What we've got to invest is some time. And if we begin to invest that time, we're going to see those practices develop in us. And as a community, as we practice these things together, the world's going to look at that and go, what's going on? I want some of that. That's right, because when you get to heaven, 
It's not going to matter how many NBA championships you've won. What's going to matter is do you know Jesus? Did you follow Jesus? That's what's going to matter. And see, when you invest in those kind of things, that's when you're going to get to hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. And I pray that we put these things into practice. So there's no time like the present. Are you ready to start practicing? Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for giving us the Bible. Because, Lord, you, you've given us, as has been said before, a, a guide, a map. The word Bible itself, I love the, the acronym, basic instructions before leaving earth. Lord, you've given that to us. And I just pray for those who say that they believe in Jesus, they follow Jesus, that we would practice what the book says. We wouldn't pick and choose. We would live it out. And so, Father, I just ask today, Lord, if there's any watching, listening, sitting here right now, that the first thing, if they're not sure if they know you, if today would were to be the end of their life, where would they spend eternity? Would it be heaven or hell? I pray that that question would get answered first. Or that they would recognize that they're a sinner. Their sin has separated them, God, from you. But Jesus, you died on the cross to pay for that sin and restore that relationship. That they would say, I believe it. Jesus, I believe in what you did. They would put their faith and trust in you, Jesus, and say, I want to follow you. Because in that moment, again, the Bible tells us you forgive, you make them a new creation. So I pray that that would get settled today if there's any question there. But Lord, for those who are watching, listening, sitting here, and they know you, if there's a place, Lord, where some habits are slipping, if there are things you're wanting them to put into practice, Holy Spirit, convict. They've got a neighbor they need to tell about you. They need to just say the name of Jesus. They've got a family member that they need to go to and ask forgiveness for. Whatever it may be, if there's something they're not doing, that they would do it. Get that right. The Holy Spirit, please speak to us. Help us to, to walk each day. And move in us. And Lord, may each day just be a moment of surrender. We say, I'm not going to walk this day my way. Jesus, I'm going to walk it your way, which is according to your word. So please move. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we're coming to the close of our service, I, I honestly don't know what God is up to in your heart and in your life. And any of those things I was praying about, whether it's saying yes to Jesus, whether it's saying, all right, Lord, I'll go take care of that thing. I'll put into practice what you've been telling me. I've been trying to put you off. It's easy to be like Jonah. Okay? God told him to do something. What did he do? He ran. That's easy to do. But let us not run from Jesus. Let us run to him. And so whatever decision you might have made this morning, would love for you to share that with us because we want to encourage you in that. We're talking about community. We do this together. So if you've made a decision, if you can go online, cbcmodesto.org slash decision and just fill out that form and share that with us because we want to contact you. We want to help you through that. We need each other. And so thank you for sharing that with me, with us if you've made a decision. If you have any prayer requests, again, we want to continue to pray for each other. If you've got one of those situations saying, I, I need help with this. I know I need to act, but I'm not sure what to do. And so we want to pray with you and pray for you. There's a lot going on. But realize, we've got a lot to be excited about. That song, Days of Elijah, that we sang, he's talking about Ezekiel and that story where Ezekiel walks out and he sees the dry bones. And those dry bones come to life. See, when we walk and live God's word out, that's life. 
Right? That's life, and that's what we get to experience. And so as we close today, we're going to sing this song. May that be just oh, a, a song of joy, a song of praise. Lord, these are your days. You've done things in the past, but you've got more to do. You're not done yet. And so we're going to close with that song. But I want to thank you for joining us today. Just one quick reminder, leadership team, we do have a meeting after. Um, and so I thank you for your time. Be praying for us as a church. And as we l- look at all the guidelines we have, how we're going to handle those and what we're going to do with that, uh, we want to keep moving forward. And remember, the mission is sharing Jesus. The mission is not getting back in the building. The mission is sharing Jesus, living for him. And so nothing's going to stop that. And so keep praying as we keep moving forward. But let's stand and let's sing and let's lift up the name of Jesus.